So welcome everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, today, we're gonna to be going through the types of trust to trust. Try saying that five times really quickly. Um, we're joined by Holly and Terry from Ledland Lawyers, and we'll do a bit more of a, a bio and an intro into their stellar CVs and achievements in just a second. Um, but I just wanted to, to introduce us quickly, say thanks again for joining us. Um, this will be the second of our trust webinars that we've done. The first one we did would have been last month or a couple of months ago was actually a record registration and attendance for Creditor Watch webinars. We now have um, a new record, a new leader, and this is the one today. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, thank you to everyone who registered. Trust is certainly something that you know, we get asked about a lot and um, the attendance is, uh, is, is an obvious, there's an obvious reason for that. Plenty of people have questions about it um, from basic questions around the types of trusts that exist into the more granular details um, that our guest contributors will get into today. As always, please don't be shy to ask questions. Use the questions in the control panel uh, for GoToWebinar. We will hopefully have a bit of time left at the end. There's plenty to get through today. Um, if we don't get back to your questions during the session, um, we'll be sure to farm those questions out um, whether it's myself that comes back to you if it's a Credit Watch related question um, or the lovely Ledland Lawyers team looking after us today as well. If it's a more technical or legal question, um, they'll be in touch. So without further ado, I will throw out to you guys to kick off. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Pat. Sorry guys, this is my fault. I jumped ahead earlier, just testing it out. There we go, we're ready. Thanks, Pat. Uh, morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are listening to this. Uh, I'm Terry Lidlin and I'm very pleased to, uh, to be able to do this webinar today. Over the years, I would have to say that trusts are one of those topics that people seem to struggle with. Maybe it's because they're a bit less transparent than other business structures. Maybe it's because the concepts seem a little difficult to understand, but we've tried to fix that today. The million dollar question often that we get from clients is, can I trust a trust? So before we get started, perhaps we could just do a quick poll question to set the tone. So the poll question is, do you feel like you can trust a customer who is a trust? So plenty of people voting, thank you for that. We're almost done, give it another five seconds or so and we'll have a look at these results. All right, I'll close that. Let's have a look at these results. Give it one sec, all right. Okay, so a bit of a split, more saying no than yes. Our view is, you can absolutely trust a trust, but only if you have an understanding of the main types of trust, together with an awareness of their common loopholes and errors. So what we're going to do now is to just break this whole concept down and walk you through as to what's on today. Holly, take us through that. We've got two main parts to take you through today. Part one, we're going to help you understand the common types of trust that you're likely to encounter in business together with real examples to help you break it down in an easy to understand way. And part two, we're going to give you our tips and measures to handle the common errors, loopholes and misconceptions about trusts that we most frequently come across. 
Firstly, a little fun information about Creditor Watch, and I'm happy to learn that a fun fact about Patrick is that he has a massive sweet tooth and set a trend for frozen Tim Tams in the office. But if you'd like to know a bit more about Creditor Watch, that's on the slide there. And same thing with Leadland Lawyers. Today, all you need to know is Terry supports the underdog and I'm not related to Lauren Jackson, despite being six foot two, but I can slam dunk a good case. So let's get straight into the common trust types that you're likely to come across in business. I think we've got another poll question to kick this off, Patrick. Yeah, let's jump in. How often do you encounter trust as customers? load. So how often do you encounter trust as customers? This is the second of three polls, so don't worry, we're not going to hit you with one every single uh, every single slide. Uh, we'll have one at the end just to ask how we're going. So most people have voted, that was extremely quick, thank you for that. Share some results here. So another good split, we've got a lot of people in the very frequently uh, answered box and also sometimes as well. So a lot of you out there are encountering trust and dealing with them. So I think the most important thing to do today is we don't want to assume any prior knowledge. We're going to start with the basics. And that is a simple trust, so the most basic form of trust. And what is that? That is a relationship between two people where one owns the property, that's the beneficiary, and the other, the trustee, holds that property in his or her possession for the benefit of the beneficiary. So what's a real life example to help you understand this? Let's take something that you might have seen or even been a part of in your own lives. Take two parents, for example. They set up a bank account for their young daughter and deposit money into that account periodically. Legally, the parents as the trustee are holding the money on behalf of the daughter. They own the money in it and they own the account. However, the daughter as the beneficiary has the right to the money since her parents hold it on her behalf and for her benefit, probably until the daughter reaches a certain age. So that's probably a really easy way to understand a simple trust uh, in, in real life. Next, we have a unit trust. Terry, do you want to help us yeah, understand sure. that? So a unit trust is a type of fixed trust where beneficiaries are nominated in the trust and they have a certain set share to the trust capital, the trust assets or the trust income. In other words, it's all predetermined. The trustee is obligated to manage and distribute the trust property according to the fixed shares. And of course, beneficiaries can enforce those fixed entitlements. So a good way to think about this, if we um, consider that Sydney Siders in particular and Australians in general are obsessed with property, then a good example would be to think of uh, a block of apartments. Uh, and when I say a block of apartments, I'm talking about one that's still standing. So if we think of a block as broken up into one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments, then each unit holder has an entitlement in the block depending upon the size of the unit. So if we stick with our property example, we've got uh, the owner's corporation or the body corporate um, or the strata manager making determinations based on each of those entitlements. So when it comes to general expenses, the one bedroom one will have a lower share of it and the three bedroom one will have a greater share. 
So unit trusts can be equal or they can be unequal in terms of the shares. The next type of trust is a discretionary trust and I suspect this will be the one that is most common. In the way that the units in a unit trust are fixed, a discretionary trust is not fixed. And as the word suggests, discretionary trust is characterised by the trustee's discretion. So that means that the trustee will have an element of judgment and choice in the way that trust property is distributed. And that'll be set out in the trust deed. Just remember that the beneficiaries have no actual right. Their share will be determined by the trustee's discretion. So they will only have an expectation of what would be available to them. A lot of family trusts are set up as discretionary trusts. And if we keep with a the property theme, uh, an example might be, if you think of it in these terms, a family in a house, there are bedrooms that are all different. Um, and of course the trustee, let's call mum the trustee, because mum tends to run everything, including the house. So she will determine who gets what. In other words, she will determine um, what rooms people will uh, have, assuming four bedrooms. Teenager might have the, um, I say the moody teenager, might have a bigger room uh, away from everybody else. Uh, somebody might need more wardrobes. Somebody might need um, an ensuite, and there's even a doghouse. And sometimes mum makes the decision that dad might end up in the doghouse. But the point is that each family member, i.e. the beneficiaries, have different entitlements in that house that are not the same and they're not fixed. They're instead decided by the trustee, mum's discretion. Some other trusts that you have probably heard of are a testamentary trust and also a charitable trust. So firstly, a testamentary trust is one that's established under a will. And that comes into effect once the person making the will, the testator or the testatrix dies. A testamentary trust, it's designed to give greater control over estate planning and distribution to beneficiaries rather than what a standard will would. For example, a will maker might intend to leave assets to a person who has significant business risks. So if they're in business, a sole trader, whatever it might be, uh, a testamentary trust will give greater control and protection to that person. Same as perhaps an adult child needing family law protection. The charitable trust is, as the name suggests, it's a type of trust that facilitates the transfer of gifts from an individual or a family or a corporation to a charity. Those funds are usually invested and the income is distributed to charities for the promotion of a special purpose that's outlined in the trustee. So for example, the special purpose must be obviously charitable in nature and it has a public purpose element rather than a private one. So the discretionary type family trust that Terry was talking about before is more of a private type of trust. Charitable will be more public. For example, the advancement of education or the relief of poverty. Our tip here is rather than a real life example, you're not likely to encounter these types of trusts in your day-to-day -day business, but the point is to be aware of them. You wouldn't do your own brain surgery, so I guess get the experts on, on board and it's about knowing when you need to get legal advice and get your outside help. So that's the main thing with the testamentary and the charitable trusts. And I guess as a simple summary, let's just go over those things again. Terry, we've got a simple trusts, yep. we've got unit trusts which are fixed, we have the testamentary trusts which are discretionary, oh, sorry that's the uh, discretionary trusts, 
And we've also got other types that you're not likely to come across, but they're charitable and testamentary. On to part two now, and I'm sure you're all really excited to find more out about this. It's our errors, loopholes, and misconceptions about trusts that we often see. The first one is a common misconception where I'm just going to go right out there and use the word dodgy. A lot of people tend to think that trusts are, there's something wrong with them or they're, they're shonky or whatever. A prime example of this is a question that we have been asked before and that's can a trust be sued or can you actually sue a trust? And I think this comes down to the perceptions that people have about trusts and the different types of people or different types of perceptions. So when we think about the public, that's all of us, the public usually thinks of trust as in a state of mind where someone's word is taken on face value and that's we accept what is said without lies or deceit involved and we have faith in the person giving their word. But I think the confusion comes in about the legal concepts of what a trust is and the terms that are used. An accountant, on the other hand, it's a different concept altogether. We often see accountants, and I'm sorry to any accountants out there in advance, um, accountants will see a trust as a means to better structure the incidence of taxation and manage, manage assets. Now, the key word there, I think, is structure and manage, not avoid, not hide. Perhaps it's sometimes wrongly assumed that this is about evading or avoiding, whereas it's, it's, it's actually not. But to us lawyers, it's also a different concept altogether. It's, a trust doesn't have a legal personality like what a person or a company does. It's not actually a separate legal entity. Instead, it's a collection of rights and obligations it's a relationship between beneficiaries, a trustee and property, which is formally established in most cases, or at least the ones we're talking about today, by a trust deed. So our tip to deal with this misconception is, remember that a trust is a legitimate business vehicle that you can trust. It's not technically able to sue or be sued in itself, all action has to be taken by or against the trustee, so the person or the corporate trustee. And if you still find those concepts confusing, we would definitely recommend having a read of an actual trustee itself in paper form where you can put these concepts down to paper. And feel free to contact us. We can definitely give you a precedent trustee if you'd like to have a read of one. Now we've got a loophole. Okay, so let's talk about trust transparency. And this is really trying to get to the nub of how to deal with trusts. So you've probably heard of the shield, the corporate shield, where there's a disconnect between a company and its shareholders. So in the case of trusts, it's a shield between the trustee and the beneficiaries because the trustee effectively acts as a type of shield between the beneficiaries and the trust property and any outside third parties. A few issues with trusts are that they're difficult to search because there's no common register of trusts thing about a trust also is, if you just think about it for a minute, is that the trustee is holding assets not on its own behalf, but on behalf of its beneficiaries. So what that means is if you go hunting for those assets, you are likely to be blocked because the trustee will say, well, look, I'm holding these assets for beneficiaries. You have no right to them. So that protection that trusts offer make it such an appropriate business vehicle uh, for a lot of people. 
but of course it's also what makes recovery against the trading trust more difficult. So a bit of a tip here, we're looking to try and get a direct line of sight to the beneficiaries who are the people or entities with rights to the trust assets, income or property. So the big question, how do we get a direct line of sight? I'm just going to interrupt you here, Terry, and I'm just going to say we will have a great video of this in right. time. <laughs> Terry and Holly have promised me that we'll uh, deliver a pantomime type video. My fingers are crossed behind my back right now. <laughs> um, which will be great. No, I don't forget um, these things because I know that a lot of people will get uh, good value out of it from a value out of it rather from an educational point of view, but also. Um, I'll probably have a little bit of a laugh at your expense too, which is always a bonus. It's okay, it's okay. Let's take you back. So what we need to do is to get this direct line of sight. So how do we do that? The first thing we do is make sure that your account application asks customers whether or not they're a trust. Now that sounds simple, but I can't tell you the number of account apps that we've seen clients with that don't make any mention of that at all. Our tip, let's find out. You know the old story, you will get most information from a customer in that onboarding because you have something they want. Um, so if you're ever going to ask these questions, when they come on board is the time to get it. The second way of getting a direct line of sight and to give you some protection is in your account application, you ideally would have a warranty. Now, a warranty helps you because if somebody deceives you, lies to you, is not truthful with you, and you have a warranty that says the information they have given you is true and correct, and that turns out not to be the case, then you have a remedy for a breach of warranty against that person who signed the account application. So that's your second way of trying to get a direct line of sight. Thirdly, let's ask for a copy of the trustee. So you can get more information to help you assess the credit worthiness. And of course, if somebody says, oh, I don't have that, or oh, I'm not sure, try and make it easy for them. Perhaps say something like, well, look, I'm sure your accountant would have that. Um, why don't you just contact him and ask him to send us a copy of the trustee? It's really simple. The other thing to bear in mind is, of course, a lot of customers slash people often don't know the sort of structure that they operate under because they've left it all to the accountant. So we've had clients in the past who say, well, look, the bloke just doesn't know how he operates. So again, um, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, why don't you just make contact with your accountant, send us details of, of the trust. Why do you want the trustee is the big question. Well, we want the trustee so that we can see who the beneficiaries are. And we're also looking for a right of indemnity against trust assets. So what you'll find is in trustees, the trustee has rights against the trust property against any liabilities that the trust has incurred by virtue of the trust trading. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that right of indemnity because without that, then we may not be able to get access to the assets. The other thing that we are trying to find out is of course the adult beneficiaries. Um, so once we see that trustee and who the beneficiaries are, let's work out if there's any adult beneficiaries carry out searches on those because their own credit records might um, affect your decision to grant credit. And of course, ideally, if you've got um, adult beneficiaries, then let's get some personal guarantees. 
uh, not just personal guarantees, but what we call a uh, guarantee indemnity and charge, which is designed to hopefully get you to leapfrog over any other unsecured creditors that are out there. And of course, the last tip is to open an account in two ways. Now, just bear with me as to why we would say this. First of all, you're dealing with a company in its own capacity, in other words, ABCPT1 Limited. We're also dealing with a company in its capacity as a trustee, ABCPT1 Limited as trustee for the ABC Family Trust. Why did we want to have both on the account application? Well, ideally, because then we're going to have access to whatever assets ABC owns in its own right, and also any assets that ABC has got holding or beneficiaries. So it's a two-pronged attack, once against the company in its own right, the other one against the company as trustee. The other point that I haven't raised here is something we've seen uh, in the past that you need to be wary of, and that is where you've got a sole trader or a partnership, but then transition into a company, but of course they haven't told you. Now, ideally what you would do is this, you would be monitoring those accounts. If you noticed anything different, different names on the purchase order, uh, different remittances, in other words, remittances coming from a company rather than the individuals. Alerts from Creditor Watch. Yes, well, my next point was going <laughs> to be, just make sure you monitor those things because we've seen lots of clients over the years that get caught out. They don't have the type of warranties in their account applications. And next thing we know, we've got an outstanding account for tens of thousands of dollars against a company that the client never knew really was trading with them. So a bit of a danger there. But Patrick's right, just monitor that stuff. So Holly, let's talk about PPSA. Unfortunately, Terry, this is the most common error that we see when it comes to trusts, and that is easily losing a PPSA security against a trading trust because your registrations are defective. Often this is at the end of your customer's life cycle if it's a, if it's a company that you're dealing with but it is acting in its capacity as a trustee. Um, then you're filing your proof of debt and you're getting a response from the liquidator to say, sorry, the goods are mine, uh, they're not yours because your security is uh, defective and you've lost it. The reasons why we see that is because the PPSA is highly prescriptive and unforgiving. The reason being is that the PPS register is, it's essentially a public notice board to the world telling them of your security. If the public is misled about the information on that notice board, then, or well, they can't find the information, or it's wrong, then the regime simply doesn't work. It has to be, it has to be right. So, the first reason for many PPSA errors that we see is that lack of transparency that we were speaking about before. For example, the customer hasn't told you that they are trading as a trust or your searches haven't been uh, able to turn up the trust or you can't find out who the trustee is, that lack of transparency is, it will lead to your registrations being defective because you're not using the correct information. The second is when you do have the inf information but the registration process itself involves errors. And the most common one there is registering a PPS uh, security against the ACN of a corporate trustee, where the registration should actually be against the ABN of the trust in accordance with the PPS rules. Our tip for PPSA registrations when it comes to trusts is 100% get an expert to help you. This is still one of the most complex and difficult areas, uh, PPSA, even though we're many years on, it's still really difficult. 
So get that, get that uh, expert help when it comes to your registrations and verify the customer information as you're opening the account as we were speaking about before. Another one is make sure your terms and conditions offer the best protection. If you haven't reviewed your terms in a number of years, you might not actually be creating your security in the best way that you could. So uh, our tip would be to review that and make sure that they're up to date. And again, remember that strict time limits apply to the PPSA. Uh, so register at the same time as opening a new account at the very least. So just for me to jump in here, I think um, when we talk about experts, um, Terry and Holly and, and the rest of the team at Ledland Lawyers are certainly the best or if not up there with the best, they're very modest about it, the way they go about it, but they've been extremely helpful to, to Credit Watch internally with our own PPSR Logic product that most of you would know about, um, but also plenty of our customers. So certainly a ringing endorsement from myself. So just to summarise there, the main errors or misconceptions or loopholes that we see there are that incorrectly trusts are dodgy, they're not. Uh, remember, they're legitimate business vehicles. Uh, we've got a loophole, uh, transparency of trust, and remember to get your direct line of sight to the beneficiaries. And then errors with PPSA, make sure you're getting that right so you're not losing your security against trading trusts. Patrick, over to you. How can we help? So very briefly here, um, just to reiterate what it is that you know Credit Watch can do in this particular um, I guess, discussion. Credit reports, as both um, Terry and Holly touched on, very important to run. Credit Watch provides credit reports, not just on companies and the trust or corporate trustees, so to speak, those entities with an ACN, but also on the ABN only trusts themselves and other unincorporated entities like sole traders and partnerships. So very important to run your searches on all those, um, on both the, the trust and the trustee. Um, and set up alerts on both of them as well. So you've got the monitoring and alerts there, which is my second point. Um, third point that I've got here, KYC and UBO. So a recent uh, product development that we released was our UBO report, which is ultimate beneficial owner. Um, and what that will do is really help you out with um, corporate or complex corporate structures where you might have ABC Proprietary Limited, um, the shareholders, 50-50 split are both corporate um, uh, both corporate entities. So then you need to actually run a search on each of those entities and so on and so on. That can run up to you know dozens of ASIC extracts reports needed to be run. The UBO report will do that for you. Um, we've built it so it will spit out who the ultimate beneficial owner is and all the entities that are associated with it from a shareholding perspective and whether they are beneficially owned or non-beneficially owned, very important. The non-beneficially owned ones are generally involved in some sort of trust, so it's a good way to sort of double check the information you're getting from your clients. And the fourth one that I thought about um, as Hotly was talking then was Apply Easy. Now, one of the things that we developed when we created Apply Easy was the fact that straight up we will ask for the ABN of the entity that is applying for an account. So ApplyEasy is an online credit application that we roll out for your business, replicating your credit application, uh, paper-based credit application, making it available online. The applicant will add their ABN in. If it is associated with a trust or it is a trust, we will flag that immediately and ask for the trustee details, whether that is it, you know, an individual or a corporate trustee. And even take it a step further, and if you want, you can force them to upload a copy of the trust deed. So very important there, um, and certainly a you know in today's technologically advanced world, um, people are much more comfortable submitting information online. They're also aware of the fact if they don't submit you know a mandatory question, they cannot move on to the next step. So that's a great way to sort of get people to or force people to. Um, be upfront with their, their corporate structures and even to provide copies of their trustees, for example. So one last poll question, as I promised. Um, did you find this webinar useful? Obviously, this is really good for us to make sure that we are doing the right thing. Um, it is very rare 
that we get no's, which is always nice. But the last one I did, did have a few no's in there, made contact with a few of the um, people who responded. It was great to get their feedback and understand what we could be doing better. So please don't be shy to say no. If it wasn't useful, we're always keen to hear feedback. Obviously, from a feedback perspective, you can give it to us via the questions panel, um, or we can be in touch, or you can be in touch. So just having a look at the results, 84% saying yes, it was um, useful, which is great. 15% saying, can we please dive deeper? 100% we can dive deeper. Lots of percentages being thrown out by myself at the moment. Um, I would expect to see um, the third edition of our Trust webinar series continue, um, where we'll look even closer um, at how they, they work, how they operate and how to deal with them. Jumping back in, that takes us pretty much to the end. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to Terry and Holly for joining us. A huge amount of preparation and work went into this. Um, you can see there's notes and notes in our little office that we're sitting in at the moment. Um, so thank you both for joining us. Always yes, thanks good. For thanks thank for having you. us. Yes. No pleasure. Um, now, from a questions point of view, I'm conscious of time. Um, so what we might do is actually just go through the questions very quickly and pull out any um, any ones that we sort of feel will answer um, questions that multiple people would ask. Um, so give me one second to just open this up. Are there any that you see here? So we've got okay. a question here. What is a settler and what role do they play in a trust? Where do they fit in when it comes to KYC and commercial due diligence? Hopefully not too tricky for you here, Terry. <laughs> Holly's taken a back seat. Yeah, she has. You, can, just... take, you can take this one. <laughs> I was just about to handball it too. <laughs> it's called a hospital pass. <laughs> so a set law is the person who creates the trust. So think of it this way. You've got trust property. In other words, property that's held for somebody else. But we need to start the process somewhere. So the way a trust deed works is a set law will make a contribution, an initial amount, might be $100. And what we say to clients when we're setting these things up is, that will be the first piece of trust property. So that will be the first entry in any bank account. And thereafter, any other property then gets added in, but we need an initial amount. So the set law is that person who gives that initial amount to the trustee. And from there, property is then added. And for example, it might be that monies are borrowed and those monies used to purchase assets. They then go into the trust et cetera, et cetera, from a due diligence point of view, and this might be something for the more in-depth stuff, um, there's legal issues if there's any suggestion that the set law got those monies returned. So if, for example, I was setting up a family trust for Pat, with $100, the expectation is that I would make that contribution to the trustee, but there can be no suggestion that it is paid back. So that's the reason why often we have set laws being grandparents or somebody who would have a genuine interest in setting up a family trust. I'm gonna jump in there. I'm just conscious of time and I know that um, we do end up getting shut down via GoToWebinar, oh, right. the program that okay. we use. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go, there's plenty of questions coming through, which is great. Um, we will go through them. We will get them answered either by Creditor Watch or um, by Terry or Holly. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, a big round of applause 
I'm not sure if it's weird for you to, to clap at your desk, but a big round of applause. Thank you to, to Terry and Holly. Um, and we will see you very soon for our next webinar. There's a couple scheduled in already. Feel free to jump onto the webinar page that we have. Um, and obviously you will receive, receive invites very soon for those. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great week.